you never realize how much power you have. How much power you have until you're just totally broken and you have nothing left to give. And then it's just like this little flicker within that just, it empowers you. And once it empowers your thought, it can't help but change your reality. I was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia. I grew up in a middle-class neighborhood with both parents up until adolescence is when they divorced. Um, had tons of friends, big tomboy, climbed trees and stopped signs, and I've always been an A student in school. It was a pretty easy, normal childhood up until the point of divorce. My father has always been a protector and the breadwinner, but he was not emotionally evolved. That's something that I always, always longed for from my father, and the divorce didn't help that. Some of the things that I needed to learn and I needed to receive as a younger girl, those needs began to get greater as I became a teenager, and that was the turnaround. It was actually on one of my first jobs where I met my trafficker. I was 16 going on 17, working as a hostess and learning to serve. And he was a very suave, very well put together, charming man who happened to be 30. Uh, and we began to hang out. He would take me home because I obviously didn't have a car. And that turned into gifts here and there on those rides and having conversations, which turned into sex, which then turned into a conversation of having sex with others or a return on his investment. Victims of sexual exploitation have their minds fooled to think that this lifestyle is the right way to live, just like I believed. The first occurrence or the introduction into the life, uh, we were hanging out with a few of his friends, which I came to find out they were traffickers also, and hanging out with their girls that they had. And it was through them. It became more of a grooming process where, you know, this is what we do, we hang out, you know, we, we smoke, we drink, we eat, we have fun, and we go to work, and this is our work, and this is what we do. And, you know, you can make this kind of money. And, you know, in the midst of all of that, my trafficker is telling me how much he loves me and, you know, how important I am to him. And I had to hold him up on that, you know. And so that led to the first time. At the most, my trafficker had five girls of all ethnicities. They all came from broken homes in some way some form, whether there was sexual abuse, drug abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, divorce, it came from every range, as well as financial ranges. Certain buoys and certain pieces, when those pieces are missing, and there's this embodiment of, I don't even know the best phrase for it, but they fill that void. The traffickers fill that void, and they're very, very, very intelligent, very intelligent at keying in on what those voids are. So if you didn't have a father, I'll be that daddy. If, you, if you've never fallen in love, I will be that first love. And by filling in those blanks, they're giving these young women something they never had. When I was 14, I started running away. While I was out, I got recruited into the life by this guy I used to hang out with. Growing up in a home where we didn't have much, it sounded like a dream come true.
Obviously, there's similarities in terms of who has been sexually exploited. We know risk factors. We know that most of them are coming from homes fraught with abuse and neglect, domestic violence in the home. They've experienced sexual abuse, oftentimes a lot of drug and alcohol usage in the home. So there's these risk factors. But again, especially with the change in media and technology, this can happen to anybody. When children are being trafficked, the initial trafficking may not be recognized by the youth as that they're being exploited or trafficked. There's a lot of subversive attempts by the trafficker to keep the youth thinking that what is happening to them is this is normal, this is what other people do. I didn't realize I was exploited until years after the life. It was like normal life, but opposite in day and night. Our day started at four or five o'clock in the afternoon where you got up, you showered, you ate, and it was time to go to work. That generally started around eight o'clock and quite often didn't end until about eight, nine o'clock in the morning when everyone else is going to work. The conversation between the trafficker and the youth is, allow me to hold on to your money so that it'll be safe. But at the end of the night, when it's all said and done, there's no transfer of that money back to you. There's so much manipulation involved. One minute you're beating me, but the next minute you're telling me how much you love me. The first time that I was arrested in Atlanta, I was arrested by an undercover uh, police officer. I was 17, so I was sent to pretrial. I was sent to the adult facility and released hours earlier. He paid the fine and I was back at work the next night. If we realize that a young woman has been involved in sexual exploitation and then we charge her with prostitution and lock her up without therapeutic services, all we are doing is confirming what the perpetrator has been telling her all along, that you're worthless, you're good for nothing, and that absolutely is not what we should be doing as a system of care. I do receive the question of why don't you just leave often? The easiest thing that I could relate to that is a domestic violence relationship between a husband and a wife or a girlfriend and a boyfriend. It's a trauma bond and it's an emotional bond. It's, it's, it's bonds on levels that I have yet to understand. And you do try to leave. And when you're physically harmed and your life is in danger, you sometimes bargain with yourself. Do I want to be safe or do I really want to take that chance? Drugs took over and healed any emotions I was feeling from going out on those dangerous streets to having sex with old men for money that would go to a man, a pimp, who would beat me and threaten to kill me if I would ever leave or snitch on him. I was afraid to leave because he knew where my family lived. He was aware where my friends live. He was aware of the high schools that I went to. He knew so much about me that I didn't want this part of my life to be exposed. It's really difficult for the youth that we work with to escape their traffickers and exploiters for a few reasons. Who will care for them or who will support them because they've been through so much. The other thing is, you know, how do I fit back in? I can't go to high school. I haven't been to high school in three years or since middle school, and they don't understand what I've been through. I can't fit in. So they really feel isolated and um, a lot of shame around what has happened to them. When I begin to attempt to leave again and again, he and I moved to New York. And that is how I ended up in the city and I would work there. My family was so pushed away and so far away, I had no one to turn to. And things just kind of went from bad to worse at that point. I was arrested several times in New York City by undercover police officers and on other occasions where they would pick up girls and charge them with loitering. And I had the option to either go to Rikers Island or go to gyms. I chose gyms, obviously. And it didn't end there. 
This award actually recognizes, probably for the first time publicly, that the commercial sexual exploitation of children in our country is a human rights issue. Seeds were planted. The dynamics and the thought and process of pimps and the, the, the manipulation that they use, those are just seeds that were planted going through her program because I went home every night to my pimp and I went to work every night and I still had to go through that program, which was a lifesaver that didn't reveal itself until a few years later. I think we need to recognize that in the day-to-day -day press of juvenile delinquency cases in a typical juvenile justice system, you can't in a five-minute court hearing figure out how to respond to these cases in an effective way. And that's why system players typically fall back on what's available to them. And what's available to them is a detention center where at least they think that the kids are kept away from the streets or kept away from their pimps. It is not a solution, however. It's the illusion of a solution. Being arrested over and over again uh, did nothing, absolutely nothing. But going through gyms gave me the knowledge and gave me the truths of what I was doing, things that I didn't even see within myself. And uh, that was more beneficial, and those types of programs are more beneficial than doing these arrests because it just, just makes these girls angry. The Illinois Safe Children's Act is one of the most comprehensive and sweeping pieces of legislation to be enacted across the country, aimed at protecting children who are victims of sex trafficking. It was necessary, I believe, for uh, the Illinois Safe Children's Act because when I looked at everything and analyzed how we have been handling these cases traditionally, uh, clearly we weren't being effective. Uh, and so we thought we have to do a better job um, at uh, this type of crime and we have to do a better job at getting to the people who are really creating this crime. The new law allows us to um, put these children into uh, a system where they're getting the social services they need as opposed to just putting them into the juvenile justice system. Because in the past we've seen that just doing that by putting them into the juvenile justice system doesn't necessarily help them. The Minnesota Safe Harbor legislation removes the conflict in our law that allows sexually exploited children to be treated as criminals. Michelle mentioned earlier in the interview, we have a nationally recognized model in Ramsey County, Minnesota, a public health approach for how to deal with sexually exploited children. What this legislation does is it gives a roadmap and a path and a timeline for that type of model to be built out all across the state of Minnesota. What's important about the Safe Harbors legislation is that it's going to open people's eyes and it's going to give them something to think about and a different perspective on how they viewed um, children that have been exploited, sexually exploited. I think that's going to be the most positive outcome. What's been so critical in Georgia's system is it really being victim and survivor focused. We need to first acknowledge that these are in fact victims and we need to train our law enforcement to ensure that they know how to identify and conduct investigations and connect the victims to services. And we need to provide our prosecutors with tools so that they can effectively prosecute these cases. And then we need to create a very holistic mental health delivery, service delivery system. We know that teens who have been sexually exploited have much higher rates of self-harm more likely to attempt suicide, they're more likely to have suicidal ideation. They're also more likely to have symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So when we think about the effects of sexual exploitation, I think they're the immediate effects that you may be able to see. But they're also insidious, they're long-lasting, and they're going to need treatment for a long period of time. I was arrested one more time uh, after gyms. And upon that arrest, they give you the physical and things of that nature, blood tests if you like while you're arrested. I found out I was pregnant. That was another turning point for me. One night I was just fed up and I just had it set in my mind and in my heart that whatever I gotta lose to leave, to get out of this situation, it wasn't gonna be my life and it wasn't gonna be my son. And uh, the night that I left was a very, very ugly night. 
we did get in a physical altercation with my five-month-old in my arm. He put the dog on me. I'm fighting him and getting away from the dog and holding on to my child with my bags, trying to leave home, or what was home at that time. And um, I was able to get away. One thing that I, that I try to teach the girls over and over and over again is that what you've been through is not who you are. I have a few girls that are eloped now, and I spoke to one yesterday, and she's crying on the phone, and she's really upset. And, but I know she didn't want to tell me where she was. I know she didn't want to tell me who she was with. So, you know, I just told her, you know, are you okay? Are you okay? That's all I need to know. And when you're ready to talk, I'm here, you know, and if and when that time comes, I'm here. And they just need to know that somebody's there not judging them. County sheriffs can take a big role in changing the law and the way that sexually exploited children are handled. We can do that because we are the chief law enforcement officer of the county we are sheriffs of. We are elected officials. We have an input in the state legislation as well as national legislation and making sure that we can treat these youngsters in a victim way rather than a criminal way. And we're doing everything we can to get the word out to some 2,500 elected district attorneys or state's attorneys or solicitors across the country that this is something they need to pay attention to. And frankly, it's been under the radar for a long time. You can make simple changes just by modeling it in your own behavior, in your own position of power. I think in most police departments, how you treat people uh, and how you treat a certain crime is going to start at the top. When officers call me regarding a situation and I give them good information about how to deal with a victim who they think is sexually exploited, that's something that they will take on with the next time, the next case. Is this too progressive of an approach for a state's attorney uh, is the question I was asked, and I don't believe so. I, I, you know, because I think, you know, at, well, I know that the job of the state's attorney is to see that justice is done, and we are there to help victims, and so we have a duty to help victims, and I think this is uh, changing of the law is necessary to be able to accomplish that mission. If this were our child, or our relative, or the child of a neighbor that we knew and cared about, would we do anything but be completely urgent in trying to stop this exploitation? These organizations have such an effect on commercial sexually exploited children's lives in a way that there's no level of reimbursement that could be made. You know, and that's why I do what I do now and it's, it's quite rewarding. It's quite rewarding, it's also healing. It's healing, and it, and it helps me to, even with dealing with the families and the children, to be a better mother to mine, as well as certain things that I see within myself through the other parents as well as through the children. So it's just as rewarding for me as it is for them, so it's, I think it's a great trade-off.